Hello and welcome to How Do They Do It? A journey to raise awareness about useful microbes. This activity is brought to you by the Safeguarding Health Through Infection Prevention or SHIP team, a group of enthusiastic researchers at Glasgow Caledonian University who are committed to helping improve care for patients and the public by reducing infections. Microbes or microorganisms are also known as germs or bugs. They are tiny living organisms too small to be seen with the naked eye. There are three main types, viruses, bacteria, and fungi. You might have heard about some germs that are harmful and can make us sick, such as COVID-19, which is a virus. However, other microbes are very useful. Are you ready to learn some more about these helpful microbes? Bacteria and yeasts, a type of fungus, are naturally present on most foods. They play a major role in food spoilage, but they've also been used for thousands of years for food preservation, leading to the transformation of the original food into a new one with different flavors, texture, and appearance. The microbes eat some of the food components, for example, sugars, and produce other substances that transform the food. Carbon dioxide production by yeasts can cause baked products to rise and fizziness to be imparted on drinks. Acid production changes the taste and appearance of foods such as cheese and yogurt with the added benefit of food preservation because many of the microbes that cause food spoilage do not like acid. At first, it is likely that these foods will have been preserved and transformed into new foods by accident. But over the years, humans have deliberately added different microbes to foods to create different types of products. Some products more traditionally associated with European foods are shown here, such as bread, yogurt, cheese, sauerkraut, and salami, along with some other products from other parts of the world that are rising in popularity in the West, such as kimchi, natto, kombucha, and kefir. Not only do the bugs preserve the food, they also make them safe by killing or inhibiting disease-causing germs. Salami, for example, is made from raw meat that would be unsafe to eat. But good bugs produce acid inside the salami and coat the outside, making it safe to eat, in addition to changing the texture and flavors. Intriguingly, many of these products will contain live good bugs in them when we eat them. These are known as probiotics, and there is lots of evidence to suggest they are beneficial to our health. Many different species of bacteria and yeasts are involved in the production of these foods. Bacteria are generally round or rod shaped, but there are many different types of each with various features that make them useful in food production. The same can be said for yeasts, although these tend to be more ovoid in shape. There are many different types and each are associated with particular foods again adding different flavors and characteristics depending on the substances that they produce. These bugs all have scientific names. And we've given you three examples here with high powered microscope images of what they look like. There are the round shaped bacteria known as Streptococcus thermophilus and the rod shaped bacteria Lactobacillus acidophilus. These are important in yogurts. There's also yeast like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which are important in many foods and drinks such as kombucha. Have a try at pronouncing the scientific names yourself, but we can stick with calling them bacteria, yeast, or bugs for now. The food products shown here contain live bugs and may be considered to be probiotics. Many people take them because they enjoy the food and drink, but some are also attracted to the live bugs contained within for perceived health benefits. As if bacteria and yeasts weren't cool enough already, we also use them in factories to create chemicals and medicines. For example, the production of insulin by genetically engineered bacteria and yeasts has saved millions of lives around the world. Even more impressively, however, there are also microbes that live on and within our bodies and play an active role in keeping us healthy. Their cells actually outnumber ours, and we have more of their genes in our body than our own. Our mouths, 
our intestines and our skin are packed with these helpful bugs. They stop harmful germs from taking hold and causing disease. They're important in digestion and produce nutrients like vitamins for us. And they help keep our immune system healthy. The balance is very important for a very healthy life. It is scientifically proven that we need bugs to stay healthy. And doctors have even found that taking the bugs from a healthy person and transferring them to another person can help to treat some diseases. Now that you've learned about how helpful microbes can be for us, it's your turn. It's time to have some fun with some helpful bugs. Try this recipe for making bread to see how yeast works. You will need a large bowl, 500 grams of strong white flour or wholemeal flour, 300 milliliters of water at room temperature, two tablespoons of salt, seven grams of fast action or 12 grams of fresh yeast, three tablespoons of olive oil or any vegetable oil will do, a clean cloth or cling film to cover the dough bowl, baking or grease proof paper, and finally an oven heated to 220 degrees, or a fan assisted oven heated to 200 degrees, or a gas oven heated to gas mark seven. You can use your hands to knead the dough, or if available, you could use a mixing machine with the dough hook attachment. If you're a child and planning to use a mixing machine, be sure that you do everything as safely as possible. Ask an adult to help you and with the oven too. Remember that this recipe can be adapted as you wish, for example, by adding different seeds. These are the steps to make bread. Put the flour into a bowl or a mixing machine bowl with the hook attachment on. Add the salt and yeast as shown. Make a well in the center, add the oil and gradually add the water and start mixing. As the ingredients start to come together, don't worry if it's sticky, this is just part of the fun. Just keep moving your hand in a circle and you'll begin creating a rough bowl. And this is your dough. You can knead the dough in the bowl or tip the dough onto a lightly floured surface or oily flat worktop. Lara here prefers to tip the dough onto an oily surface as this makes the dough more elastic. Knead the dough for 10 minutes or if you're using a mixing machine, only for five minutes. Once the dough looks quite shiny and smooth, you can leave it to rest for one hour or until doubled in size. Place the dough away from cold or drafty areas as this will slow the raising process. If you have kneaded the dough in the bowl, just cover it with a clean cloth or cling film. If you've kneaded the dough on a worktop, put the dough back in the bowl and then cover it. We like to use cling film in this so we can see the dough rise as you can see in our pictures. Once it has risen, it's time to shape the dough. You can choose to make a big loaf of bread, or you can shape your dough into small rolls, like Lara's final photo here shows. Take the dough out from the bowl and play with it for a couple of minutes and shape it the way you prefer. After shaping your dough, place your loaf or your rolls onto a baking tray lined with some baking or greaseproof paper. Cover your shaped dough again and leave it to rest for another hour. While you do this, you can heat the oven up. If you have shaped your dough into a loaf, now dust it with a bit of flour and make some cuts across the top with a knife as if you were making a net. Ask an adult to help you with the knife. If you've shaped your dough into small rolls, you can now sprinkle some seeds on top. Place the baking tray into the oven. For a loaf, bake for 25 to 30 minutes, or for small rolls, bake for 15 to 20 minutes until golden brown. A wee trick to see when they are perfectly based is to tap the bottom of the loaf or rolls. You should be able to hear a hollow sound. Remove your loaf or rolls from the oven and let your bread cool on a wire rack. And then your bread is ready. Great job! So how does the yeast make the bread rise? When the flour, water and yeast are combined, the yeast cells start to eat the sugars contained within the flour. As they digest the sugar, they produce carbon dioxide or CO2. And this is the crucial feature for making bread rice. There are billions of yeast cells acting at the same time to produce lots of carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide becomes trapped in the dough and begins to expand, causing the bread to rise. Several factors can influence how much bread rises. 
the yeast is a living organism and will eat more sugar more quickly depending on temperature and sugar availability, resulting in changes in carbon dioxide production. Making bread is a great example of microbes doing beneficial things for us. However, it can take quite a while and requires an oven, so it may be easier to see yeast in action by doing a simple experiment. Scientists love doing this kind of thing, taking a complicated process and creating simple models of it. Here are some quick and easy experiments that will help you see the helpful bugs at work. All you need is a plastic bottle, a small packet of yeast that you can buy in a supermarket, a teaspoon of sugar, some warm water, not cold as the yeast like to rest at cool temperatures and not too hot or the yeast will be killed, and an empty balloon, not an inflated one as seen here because we're going to get the yeast to inflate it for us. Once you have your materials, here's a simple method you can try for this experiment. First, fill up the bottle with about 3 centimeters of warm water. Second, Add all of the yeast packet and gently swirl the bottle for a few seconds. Third, add the sugar and swirl some more. Fourth, blow up the balloon by yourself and let the air out. Do this a few times to stretch the balloon a little bit. Fifth, place the deflated balloon onto the neck of the bottle, like you can see in the picture here. And then finally, let the bottle sit in a warm place for about 20 minutes and see what happens. Now that you've got the basics down, you might want to play around with different conditions to see what effects they have on the yeast. This is another thing that scientists love to do. Ask questions about the conditions that can make processes happen faster or slower. Some ideas for changing the conditions might be adding more or less sugar in the mixture, changing the temperature at which you leave the bottle, removing or adding more yeast to the mixture, be creative and try out your own ideas for experiments involving the yeast. Just remember to follow the scientific method. A good scientist needs to be able to design and carry out successful experiments. A good experiment has to be well organized and be repeatable. Here are six basic steps you can take to make sure your experiment will be a successful one. First, ask a question. Think about what it is that you would like to find out. Second, research and hypothesize. Read about the thing you want to study and think about possible explanations to your question. Third, do the experiment. Make sure that you plan your experiment in advance and that you think about what materials you will be using and how you will carry out the experiment. You will also need to make sure that you keep the conditions of the experiment the same, with the only thing changing being the thing that you want to study. For example, if you would like to find out if plants grow better with or without sunlight, you would need to make sure that all your plants are watered the same amount of time, have the same amount of time to grow, and are planted in same sized pots in the same soil. That way, the only thing that will change is the amount of light you let your plants be exposed to. The third thing is to carefully observe what you see and write down everything in a neat and organized way. Next, after you carry out your experiment and write down your observations, you will need to analyze the results. In other words, look at what you have observed and organize it into tables and graphs. And finally, the last step is to share your results and the answer to your question. Science only works if we share the information we have learned with each other. Although today we are learning about helpful microbes, we should always remember that there are also many harmful microbes out there that we should protect ourselves from because these can make us ill. You've probably heard that in order to protect ourselves and others from these harmful germs, we should wash our hands frequently, for example, after going to the toilet, after sneezing or coughing, after playing with pets, or before eating. It is also important that we wash our hands before and after we prepare our food, like our bread. This is because we touch many different objects with our hands and often carry the bad microbes on them. Thus, washing our hands before preparing food stops the harmful germs from spreading around the kitchen and from getting into our food and subsequently into our bodies. Raw food products such as eggs, meat or even flour, which we use to make our bread, might also be covered with harmful microbes. 
which our hands can then spread to other clean objects in our house or to other food products in our kitchen. Washing our hands after preparing food will help to prevent this. And surely, you'll want to clean your hands of the sticky bread dough after you finish kneading it. But to ensure we are removing all of these harmful microbes from our hands, we need to wash our hands in the correct way. We need to lather all surfaces of our hands with soap for at least 20 seconds. But don't worry, there's a special technique called the six step technique that can help us to achieve this. This technique is recommended by the World Health Organization and is used by nurses, doctors, and other healthcare workers around the world to stop infections from spreading in hospitals. But this technique can be used by anybody, anywhere, because cleaning your hands saves lives and helps prevent infection. Let's have a look at the steps and try to learn them together. As the name suggests, it has six steps that you can see in this diagram here. But before you begin, you need to wet your hands with water and then apply soap onto your hands. Once you've done that, you can begin with step one by rubbing your palms together. To complete step two, rub the backs of your hands with the palm of your other hand. And then move on to step three by rubbing your palms together again, but this time ensuring that you rub between your fingers. The next step, step four, is about rubbing the backs of your fingers, while step five is about rubbing the thumbs. The sixth and final step involves rubbing the fingertips of one hand against the palm of your other hand. Don't forget to swap hands in steps two, five and six, so you get both hands covered in soap. After all steps are completed, rinse your hands with water and dry them thoroughly with a towel. When doing these steps, you also need to remember to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. The easy trick to achieve it is to wash your hands for as long as it takes to sing the happy birthday song twice. You can also use different songs as long as it takes at least 20 seconds to sing it. We hope that you had some fun in discovering the good bugs, making bread and learning the six steps hand washing technique. Please re-watch the video and have a go at making your own bread or doing your own experiments. We would love to hear from you, so ask an adult to help you get in touch with us via the Padlet board or the Twitter link in the description below. Thank you so much for coming on this journey with us. And remember, stay safe, keep learning with the Science Festival, and clean your hands.